I would now like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Matthew Harmelink. Dr. Harmelink is an assistant professor of pediatric neurology at the Medical College of Wisconsin. He received his medical degree from the Medical College of Wisconsin and specializes in pediatrics, and he will be presenting on new research and clinical trials in the pediatric neuromuscular space. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Harmelink, and I will hand it over to you. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm just going to quickly pull up my slides for us. We will begin. Um, so I was asked to talk about new research and clinical trials today, and that's a in pediatrics. That's a pretty big topic. Um, so first off, the disclaimer is sort of this is a huge topic. There's a lot of interventional trials. There's a lot of local studies. I will not be able to talk about any, obviously everything that's new. We'll sort of focus on trends and some larger studies that are coming out. Um, maybe give a little bit of my, my um, views on, on some certain things, and certainly you may find um, multiple views on things. And I probably will end up with more questions than answers, um, but that's why we do research, right? We don't have the answers yet. Um, we won't. We want to know more. Um, here are my disclosures. I do do some consulting ad boards, things like that for different groups. Um, so when I, we talk about clinical trials, and especially when we're talking with either um, primary care doctors who are asking about possible patients or even with families themselves, there's a couple of questions we want to start asking. Um, families should be asking themselves. First off is what is the target goal of the treatment? What does actually the treatment do? Um, I've color coded these sort of by groups, but then secondary is sort of how good is the supporting data? What is, what is needed to get into the trial or the research protocol? And what are obviously are the risks and procedures? Beyond that, there's more questions though. There's this could this exclude me for something in the future, right? If I do this trial, will it not allow me in something that might be coming down the road that I'm interested in? Um, or maybe even something that is, is more pertinent to my disease process. Um, there's these very personal questions that are, if the data is positive from a trial, when could the drug be approved? How long will that take? How will that affect me and my, my family? Would we, would we rather wait for it to be approved or not? For progressive diseases, again, for our kids, what's the time frame that they might qualify for? Is there, are they gonna get, too, too far along in the disease process if we wait versus um, are they not, not, unfortunately in some trials, not for, far enough along right now? And then this is the golden question is, what might be approved and or trial started while my child's in this trial, right? If you're, if you're in a study that you're, might be interesting, but your, your whole heart isn't into, which I would always recommend against, and you're waiting for something to come out, could there be something that you're, not, you're gonna be missing out on? Now, when we talk about target questions, um, I look at this sort of as different pieces. So really where is the treatment that we're talking about in the research going to be affecting? You know, there are non-interventional trials that are looking at natural history studies or more database studies that are a little bit different. But if we're, our target is, you know, some sort of intervention, the first question is, is it symptom-based? So this could be looking at how does BiPAP function, wheelchair activity. It could be non-disease activity. So for example, many of our diseases have cardiac involvement. Many of our cardiac meds don't actually address the actual genetic problem in a genetic disease, but may help by affecting things downstream, or just like the myostatin inhibitors, which sort of makes muscles bigger in theory, or is this research just in general trying to make us stronger? Are they protein-based? So for example, Duchenne steroids or enzyme replacement therapy and pompase, which again is still helping with the problem, but not fixing it permanently. Are we trying to do something that's more RNA-based, like exon skipping and Duchenne's and Nusinersen, where we're actually trying to change how the DNA is turned into RNA? Or, and this is obviously a hot topic, the, the DNA-based, whether it's gene replacement therapy for the microdistribution, or genzyme for Duchenne's and spinal muscular atrophy, or even you know, down the road where we have gene editing and CRISPR and those types of things. Um, I will excuse my use of Zolgensma. I'm not going to use a generic name today because it is just a mouthful um, in terms of what I'm saying. So you'll excuse my use of that, that branding name, I apologize. Um, as we break down these trials more, the red is really what the, the PIs only know in the trials and maybe can't share details. There's sometimes this data that is unreleasable um, that we may know about. But the question is, how good is the supporting data? Is it animal data? Is it phase one or two data? Is there similar platforms or, or drugs that have been used elsewhere, or even mechanisms that are just slightly changed based off the actual genetic change, like an exon skipping, for example? Um, what's needed to get in? And this isn't just a, a criteria of age and activity level. You have to be on steroids for Duchenne's or not be on certain medications for other drugs. But what's the distance to get to the 
to, to the trial and how quickly do we think this is going to, to fill up? Is there, is there a reasonable expectation that we'll be able to be screened to see if we can get enroll? And then of course, what are the risks and procedures? Um, some of these can just be from the drug, but it's also things like our, you know, drugs or trials that may have to have multiple pokes if a child just hates that, to put them through that psychological stress of, you know, weekly pokes for IV infusions or, or IV blood draws may not be the, the right, right trial for a family. Um, from the family's view, and really what I always ask the families is, what might this exclude me from the future? Is there something, and I put in quote, the pressure put in quotes, better coming out, right? Is there a, something that fits the patient better um, in terms of what they're looking for, both from a, a medical perspective, but also just a sociological perspective? Um, maybe there's something that has some better data. Maybe there's something like procedures for more. Two drugs or two trials look fairly promising the same, but one doesn't have a muscle biopsy and you're very averse to any type of procedure that might be something better for you there. Um, or something just better access to care. Um, it's, it's very unfortunate that unfortunately not every group MDA center is able to do every trial. And so again, if you have to do a weekly infusions and you want to be in a trial seven hours away, it's, it's a, that's a tough strain on families and, and on everyone to get there. Of course, there's a question, if the data is positive, when might the drug be approved? And can we wait for approval? Now there's good things about that, right? It, it, sometimes trials and research have more more uh, things that we have to do, more activities, just because we want to monitor with you know, more data is better. Um, but on the other hand, you know, you, you might get access to drug. It might be a double blind placebo where you may not know if you're getting drug or not. Um, and that might affect your approach to it as well. Um, and then if you, you wait, will your, will your child will, um, be able to be approved? For progressive diseases, this question is what's the time frame they might qualify both medically and then unfortunately not in our our day and age, we have insurance issues, especially in the US, where they may or may not approve it based on certain criteria. Um, and so certainly there are trials where maybe you can get in and, and get the drug earlier. Now, the purpose of research, of course, is always to advance the scientific field. That is the goal and to be safe while we do that. However, in especially in the rare disease world, oftentimes research and clinical care sort of does mesh a little bit in terms of access of care, especially. And so that is something that we, we have to think about outside of the, the traditional view of research just for science. And then the golden question, um, while I'm in this trial, what might be approved, what trials might be started, what, you know, uh, what, what's the field looking like? But I don't think anybody can ever guess, but my big push is if families are thinking this, that they might wanna drop out, because I have heard of this happening, um, please don't get into a trial, you're not gonna finish. It affects the data of the trial. It's a lot of work to get someone in from the research side, from the company side, from the pharmaceutical trial, and certainly from the PI side locally. To drop out really sort of makes it very difficult. Um, and make, especially if we have too much of a dropout, we may not have power to even see if it's efficacious. Um, but there are this sort of desperation sometimes we see um, to get into anything. And then I have had families I've talked to who regret getting into certain trials because now they feel obligated when something else they would prefer to do. Is involved or even procedures they only want to be part of but they feel like they to do something so a lot of questions and, and as we go forward but these are the questions i like to think about and talk with our families when i come to clinic um but the question was asked of me to present on is new and current research and so the new part really got me because there's so much coming out and so i said well why don't we approach this like a research trial right so i went to clinicaltrials.gov to look at what is out there nationally published and we pulled up uh 1406 trials listed for pediatric neuromuscular research diseases and if we narrowed that a little bit, we came down to 266 are actively recruiting. Um, so a lot that's out there is listed but not actively recruiting, either in pre-recruiting stages or has been term, uh, finished already. Um, of those, I said, well, new, right, it would be the last maybe year and a half, 106 trials, which is still too large, a group to go through in this short time frame. And if we said just since the beginning of this year, we had 47 trials. So I said, well, what, what has been started in the last year? What, should we, what can we talk about? Now, I'm not an expert on every trial. Some of these drugs I know a little bit better than others, but I um, wanted to sort of bring up what is out there in the field and hopefully use this as also a trend in what has been coming out and where, where, this, where research is going. Um, of those 47 trials, 24 were relevant. So we look at some of the non-relevant trials for our talk, right? Some more about polio vaccines or gabapentin for treating chemotherapy effects or some you know, gynecologic cancers and peripheral neuropathies. Probably not what's, what MDA is looking for. So I excluded those types of trials necessarily. And here's what we have the, for the list. And I, I leave this up there so if someone wants to go back later when this is posted and see sort of what trials I found um, that opened up in the last year, they can actually get this whole list. This is actually copy and pasted from clinicaltrials.gov. And here's our, our second part of that too. So there we go. Of that, I'm not gonna talk about all 26 because there are some, some large areas I think that, um, that I want to sort of focus on for the trend pieces. Um, so more to come. 
So I started off with thinking, okay, let's start off with that therapy target. Like, what is our target? And if we look at symptomatic target, there's some interesting trials that are very localized. But, you know, as I look through this list, I go, hmm, this is an interesting thing. I'm going to look for the data. First one is actually a wheelchair positioning and neuromuscular disease trial coming out of France. There's only two sites. Um, and they're looking for wheelchair posture and pain, posture, pain, and wheelchair, and the effectiveness of the recommended equipment. Now, it's an interesting thing because you'd think at this point we have all this data, but there's a lot of gaps in our knowledge base that are being overtly um, researched and have a lot of data coming out. Um, neurocognitive outcomes, for example, is not as well researched as we probably would. And sometimes we, we take for granted things like wheelchair positioning. So this is a uh, symptomatic interventional trial, but it's really looking at a, a, a target um, that's not overly uh, aggressive with the patients. So something to look forward to. And as you see, if you go to clinical trials, hopefully by next year in December, we'll have some data and we can talk about maybe we can modify our treatment plan. Um, on the same note as sort of other things that are interesting coming out is there's this determination of awareness and associated factors with development of neuromuscular scoliosis. So it's a bigger trial coming out of Turkey um, where they're trying to look at, you know, what are the risk factors for scoliosis? Again, bone health, back uh, pain, scoliosis surgery does vary quite a bit between the diseases, but also between the centers and how we manage it. The more data we can get, I think, in terms of preventative care, especially, which is one of these things that will come out of here to help for. The only problem, I think, for here is this is going to be a very diverse population because it's all neuromuscular disease and cerebral palsy, which I think will make it a whole bit harder. Symptomatic um, in observational study. So again, we'll see how, how the data comes out, but interesting to see. And again, more things that will be able to hopefully guide care better. Now, I'm going to switch a little bit to a few disease processes. And the first one we're going to talk about is Duchenne muscular dystrophy. I know a lot of people who are, are listening to this probably are aware of the disease, and you can certainly go to the MDA webpage for more information. As a brief overview, this is a genetic disorder that predominantly affects boys. Um, you have progressive muscle degeneration and weakness due to alterations in the a protein called dystrophin. And typically, the onset is in early childhood between ages sort of two and three. So there is some data we can actually have some subtle features earlier. Primarily affects boys, and in rare cases can affect girls because it is on the X chromosome. Um, in Amer in the Europe and North America, the prevalence is about six per hundred thousand individuals. Um, so not a uncommon un rare disease. If we look at therapies, um, when we think about genetic therapies, we have to remember that all of our body has chromosomes, 46, 23 from mom, 23 from dad, 46 for most of us. Um, on each chromosome is hundreds and hundreds of thousands of genes. And each gene is made up of portions that become protein and portions that are regulatory, and they're not all the same. Their exons become the protein and introns stay in, and they sort of, as you can see here, this is a piece of sort of the middle of the dystrophin, exon 49, and a little bit of space of stuff that's not protein, exon 50 become protein, and how they match up and line up with the coding isn't always that a whole exon just ends with all that, the amino acids, the parts of the protein. They sort of have to be translated to RNA, which fits together, taking out the introns, and then eventually become the protein. So the problem is, is well, we can have a mutation. So in a normal case, right, we have this uh, gene, becomes RNA, becomes a protein dystrophin, working well, that's for a normal, healthy person. And someone who might have Duchenne's, for example, they might be missing an exon. Let's say exon 50 gets deleted. So 49 doesn't fit in nicely to 51, and so we make maybe a little dystrophin or dysfunctional dystrophin and gets destroyed. Typically, it's under even like 1% dystrophin. And at that point, we, we really have the disease process. And I'll talk about this as we go down a little bit. But the idea is, is, well, there's multiple ways we can do this. Can we affect the RNA and maybe just skip over? Or maybe we can actually reframe it by changing some of the DNA itself. We get a shortened functional dystrophin, but maybe some other effects. So, one of the trials that actually is doing that is that opened up this year is the uh, WAVE in 531. It's looking at 15 patients and ascending doses of, of drug. Um, and it's a phase 1B, 2A study. So early on looking at increasing doses and trying to figure out what is the dose relationship um, for the drug. Starting, actually just started off just a month or two ago and looking through sort of next year. This is a drug that's gonna be affecting how our RNA and eventually downstream our protein, protein looks. And it's an interventional trial. Now, one of the things as we look at research, and especially for families, we always want to look at, again, as we start comparing things, both what are the mechanisms, what's the data. We have to be careful, though, about saying, well, a, com a single company maybe had a drug before that didn't work, because part of research is making changes, right? So we, we see what works. If it doesn't work well, we make a change. And you'll see as I do that, as I talk, we'll go through that some more. Um, I bring this up because WAVE um, actually had a 
XN51 skipping drug. Now this is X, the one I was talking about is XN53, um, that the phase one data did not show uh, changes in baseline and so they did not move on with that um, going forward. However, it sounds like looking at through their website information that there's a little bit of a difference in terms of um, what these drugs are, so it might be efficacious. And that's important to know rather than writing something off. Now, I'm not knocking away pharmaceuticals. Again, actually, we were a site for the Exxon 51 skipping drugs, so um, I think the signs might be there. The question is really going to be what is different in their platform or their drug then versus now if you want to get into the study. And that's a great question to ask uh, the PIs if you're interested in these type of studies is have there been trials before? What did it look like? All that data. Um, and then the other question for families is how do we compare this uh, Exxon 53 skipping drug to what might be actually on the market already, right? Commercial, Bolderson, the Tolderson by two different companies. How would this be better? How would this be more in intensive? Um, and again, I will always encourage families to do research because I think the more data we have, you know, this is the time where greed is, greed is good, to quote the, the 90s movie, but um, the more data is better. Um, but it is for the families you have to make that determination of, of sort of which way we want to go. Um, however, it's nice that we're having multiple drugs for some, for some of the same areas come on the field. We switch over to sort of a different type of mutation um, for Duchenne. So adalurin is a drug that's been studied for quite a while. <coughs> Excuse me, for quite a while. Um, they're actually doing a trial uh, <coughs> me, um, for kids between six and two years of age uh, looking at nonsense mutation. Adalurin is sort of a nonspecific drug for these nonsense mutations. So change where normally we have as we go through our exons again and our, our base pairs. There are combinations of base pairs that say start reading here and there's combinations that say stop reading here. If, as we have a change in our DNA, if it says stop too early, obviously that is a bad thing. And I learned sort of helps avoid that stop codon so we continue to read downstream. Um, this study is actually a 24 week treatment and has at least, at least 52 weeks of extension afterwards for safety and pharmacokinetics. So, someone coming into this would be looking at a, a almost you know, a year type study, maybe a little longer with the screening. Very small participant pool, though. Um, so, that's something a family should be aware of. This is an RNA interventional treatment. And um, it's actually showing sort of the mechanism I talked about before. So this is our polypeptide. And if we have this stop codon as we read through, we're going to say hey, it's truncated and short. If we can have adalurin, we can read that and have a longer, more normal protein. Um, it is also only one site in Atlanta, Georgia. So unless you want to travel there, that is one, one thing to be aware of. Now, the other part with adalurin we have to look up is, so not always is something not approved in the US or approved elsewhere, how regulators look at data may vary. And this can be frustrating for families um, as well. Adalurin, for example, was denied in the FDA, but approved in the EU. I believe the asterisk there, because it was at one point conditionally approved. Um, and this is actually from the initial, not this study, but the previous studies here in the US data that was presented to the FDA, it's off their website, showing that there was some effect in, in sort of preserving the, this NSA functional score over time um, compared to the placebo. The question is, is it statistically significant and significant enough? And those are all where the approval process goes into, into, into play. Um, so this is one of those cases where you have to weigh that data as well for a family coming into a trial or even for a site looking to be part of the trial to say, you know, is this a study that is the right study for my child based off where they're at? Now, what's interesting is that these trials were typically older patients. So the shift to younger kiddos, I'm anticipating, I don't know, but my guess is, is we're looking at, can we, we intervene sooner, can we see a bigger effect? Which again, we've been seeing through many neuromuscular progressive diseases, SMA, um, with many of our treatments has shown that, and even some of the steroid data on Duchenne's is showing maybe if we start a little bit sooner, we can have some better effects going forward, though we don't have long-term data and you know, years of data in, in those studies as of yet. Um, so what about other sort of non, um, non uh, similar drugs? So there is a study of ASP0367, um, this is for male participants with Duchenne's, and it's looking at uh, global safety tolerability and preliminary efficacy in a 24-week treatment period. Um, and then it has this sort of double-blinded first half, and then you go into everybody gets it with two, two different doses. Um, Aslos Pharmaceuticals is doing this in many sites throughout the U.S. Um, it's a drug that actually affects mitochondrial um, energy usage, trying to shift more to fatty acid utilization to have increased energy um, with the thought of maybe this can actually help with some of the muscle breakdown, things like that. Um, again, it's very, this would be sort of a non-specific um, to the dystrophin gene type trial. What's interesting is they're also using this drug for primary mitochondrial myopathies as well because it's a this non-specific type, type therapy. Um, this is also interesting as we start talking about multiple drugs and multiple mechanisms because one of the things you will, you will see is that we don't have, even for our approved drugs, head-to-head -head trials. It's very difficult and expensive to run, as you can imagine. Um, and because these drugs are coming out so quickly, 
um, with more data on them coming out, we're having to make these determinations really with based off the data that we have. The other question that's going to come out is dual therapy combinations, things like that. But again, we don't have really a lot of data outside of just using corticosteroids, um, which most of these trials are requiring unless it's a steroids bearing trial. And that's something I think that's, that's important for families to remember as we go forward too, as we start talking about, can we be on, outside of research, can we be on, for example, an exon skipping drug and something else? Um, and those are, those are individualized discussions that have to happen. Um, if we look a little bit still with Duchenne's, but some other sort of things that are, are cool that are coming out when I was reading through these, one is this virtual reality glasses for multimodal physiotherapies um, in Duchenne's and Becker. So the idea is can we use uh, virtual reality glasses to make increase the effectiveness uh, for physiotherapy and also looking can this be tied a little bit in to research and how we do that. Small group of participants just out of Spain, 11 people. Um, of note, if, if you look back at physiotherapy and virtual reality for the last 15, 20 years, there's been papers that are coming out in different areas for this outside of neuromuscular. So it's something that I think will be interesting as our as that technology is hitting mainstream, how do we incorporate that into, into our clinics and into our research? So um, hopefully next June, they're hoping to have the study completed. So in the next, you know, Typically, it's, I always think it's a six months to a year before we start to hear data after that. But that means you know, we might be getting some more, more information there. Um, if we go to other type of drugs, there is a, drug, a study coming out of Poland um, looking at metoprolol, approved drug on the treatment of standard of care for preventing cardiomyopathy in Duchenne's patients. I bring this up because some of the trials I've been mentioning so far, you know, a year long, 24 weeks, things like that. Um, now, those trials may affect if you want to do future research after there are possibly wash up periods for those drugs, if it's an interventional trial that way. This drug, this trial, on the other hand, is a long trial. It's a placebo, placebo interventional trial. So some kids get metropolis, some kids do not. But it's a five year trial. It's 150 patients coming out of one site in Poland. Um, the great things about this are we do get some great data comparing you know, efficacy. The only thing we have to be careful of is if we look at single center trials, is other standards of care that may differ from the, the center you're in or differ from what your, your kid child needs um, may make this a little bit harder to interpret. But these are the types of data that I, I'm also excited for. Unfortunately, it will be at this point, what, 2026, 2027 till we're, till we're getting all the data. Hopefully there'll be some cut in points in between because even in trials, we don't need to wait till the end of research to see all the data. Many times there's defined um, interim data releases that we can look at and interpret along the way. If we shift gears to spinal muscular atrophy a little bit, um, this is, uh, for those who aren't aware, degenerative autosomal recessive genetic disorder. So you have to have both copies affected. Um, it affects the anterior horn cells of the motor neurons, the spinal cord. Um, and here we can see, again, this is where the motor neurons would sit, is if we're sort of staring down someone's spine and at each level there's motor neurons that can go up to the muscles here. Um, it's recessive in that if a, mo a mom and a dad are both carriers, about a quarter of the patients will end up having uh, the disease uh, there's a 25% chance for every child, um, so over time. It is one of the more common um, genetic disorders that affects children and used to be one of the most fatal um, pediatric uh, genetic disorders, but now with treatments, not necessarily. Um, patients will be born and have over time progressive wasting of voluntary muscles. Um, typically, it's muscles proximal, so close, closer in the hips and the shoulders and distally. Legs are weaker than arms. You start getting tongue fasciculations as the, the nerves get irritable lose your reflexes and eventually have breathing problems with intercostal muscles. But as far as we know, um, patients have into normal intellect and sensation, and they're often described as this bright-eyed, hypotonic, or floppy baby. Again, if we look at the, the genetics, it's interesting in that we have an SMN1 gene, um, which is the gene that is, if it's a, both copies are affected, you have the disease. Um, and that there is an SMN2 next to it that has a teeny tiny little change. So there's you know, one little C in the thousands of letters that becomes a T. Um, and so that's been one of the mechanisms some people have looked at in some of the drugs that are FDA approved are out there is, is sort of saying, saying, well, normally this SMN2 protein becomes unstable because that little chain you can see goes 1, 2A, 2B, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, whereas normal SMN protein has to have 7. It just does, that causes 7 not to be made in from the RNA to the protein. However, if we can change that a little bit, maybe we can make SMN make more functional protein. So function of, of two of our FDA approved drugs. So there are other treatments that are coming out. Now, this drug, OAV-101, is actually approved. That's Zol Zolgensma. It is approved um, already in the US for, for um, use of kids. Um, typically, it's, it's younger children because of some dose-related effects of older kids. Um, there is this international study going on, though, for 24 patients that's actually looking at a higher weight because the question is, well, 
Oftentimes when we do these type of research trials, we take from animal models, we bring into kids, we set some guidelines, but we don't always have the perfect dosing right off the bat, or we don't always have the perfect, you know, highest weight because you have to gauge where we don't want to go above and start causing effects. And so it is somewhat of a educated guess. And as you, we start refining things, we then look at safety measures more. Can we go a little bit higher in weight and what are the outcomes? Can we go a little bit higher in the dose? Are there more side effects? And those are things that oftentimes come out after approvals in most cases of these type of pharmaceutical drugs. Um, so this is the study that's going on, um, should be completing by August, 2023. It will be interesting with this data because it would actually, it could potentially open up older kids to possibly getting Zolgensma. So more to come, it is an open label study. So everybody is getting the drug. Um, so interesting there. Um, what is also interesting though, is that just this spring, a model a paper came out of mice and it was looking at, well, if we give too much estimate protein, what happens? Because that's not something we've typically studied up until now, we've been worried about not having enough in humans. Um, so they did sort of as a quick summary, they gave mice gene placement therapy and gave them too much and they did find there are some toxic effects. Now, have no idea how this correlates to humans, have no idea if, you know, what the dosing is relative to humans, more data is needed, but it is something that as we start talking about other trials and People talk about dual therapies. I think we need to be aware of and have think about it. The problem with this again in research is this is a one small study in a mouse model. So more to come, but be aware of that. If we start looking over to things like then, okay, what happens with if we give uh, you know nusinersen? Now this is a drug that actually helps with that little C to T change I was talking about. Um, in this case, it's actually a study in France looking at some motor outcomes for patients treated, trying to see if we use this MFM thirty two study. Um, looking uh, as a, a standardized validation study. So the patients are getting treated um, only with nucinersin, so they're not using other patients, and about 60 kids will be enrolled in France. Versus, now, let's, now I sort of mentioned the dual therapy in the mouse model. Well, what happens if we look at kids who have a dual therapy? Now, th these type of trials are really interesting for me and, and many of my colleagues in, in neuromuscular because it is something that we, we need to know, right? Should, if you get one drug, can you get another? What's the safety effect? What's the long-term? Is it efficacious? What do we see? The hard part is designing those trials because um, they can be very expensive in one case or they're using more real-world data, which can sometimes throw in some confounders when we try to take that to application. This is an interventional trial here in the US. It's actually multiple sites and a few international, about 60 patients. Um, it start, it's been actually started at the beginning of the year and it's only really looking at patients who got Zolgensma and then get put on nucinersin because they think there's not a significant enough effect. And how much of effect do we actually, will we actually get? Should we be doing um, dual therapy is really one of the questions. Now, the hard part is, as you can see, the completion date is going to be in 2024, which means we're only still having a couple years of data. We're not having the 20, 30 years of data that some people would say we want to see. Um, but it is, we're going to be starting to get this, these type of studies that are coming out, which will then allow us to guide better. Because I know, as many of us know, every Many centers treat patients very differently. Some are very pro-dual therapy, some are very against dual therapy. Um, I'll be honest with you, my bias tends to be a little bit more nervous um, until I see data. So that's what tends to be how I, I approach things. Um, and then there's other discussions coming on and things that in, as we look forward in the next couple of, you know, couple of years, hopefully we'll see things like we talked about Zolgensma. What if you give it after you're on nucinersin? What if you do Ristoplam, another FDA approved drug after Zolgensma? What if you do nucinersin and Ristoplam? And then all the combinations and then things and variations there. There's also questions as you think of these trials is, is it, are they looking at efficacy? Is it efficacious? And what is the goal? What are the patients coming in looking like? And how do they improve? What is the safety? And is the safety long-term or short-term? And these are all questions we'll have to follow. Um, there is some databases I'll talk about in a bit that I think will help sort of drive this discussion some more. Um, if we shift gears a little bit to another disease that's fairly common, uh, myotonic dystrophy is a multi-system genetic disease. And it's unlike the others where it's a, a change in the gene and you tend to have not enough, um, in this case, there's a part of the gene repeats. And if we think of our DNA being sort of having two copies going together, if you get one area that gets too long, you can imagine how this part pairs up with this, this part pairs up with this, and suddenly you end up with this little hook here. And that extension and expansion repeat can cause misalignment and then can cause other protein problems downstream. In patients with myotonic dystrophy um, who have this in, the, in one of the, with their genes, you can develop muscle weakness and cramping, heart rhythm defects, endocrine problems, cognitive problems, and eye abnormalities amongst some other issues. Um, based off how long the repeat is typically determines the earlier onset of symptoms. So there's an adult onset form and there's also an onset form at birth. For congenital myotonic dystrophy or those patients who are born very early, there is a drug that's currently in efficacy and safety trial data 
um, of 56 participants in sites across the US, UK, and Australia, um, where they're assigning this medication, which is supposed to downregulate that increased probable problem protein um, and looking at some of the long term effects. So it's a randomized double blinded study. So you will not, people in the study will not know if they're getting the drug. Um, they're either getting that or a placebo, and they're looking at kids and adolescents coming out. So again, interesting as we sort of pull out some of these other diseases, this little different type of mechanism of downregulating something rather than upregulating something. Um, this is based off of the phase one study. So that the study they're doing is not a phase one; it's beyond that. But there's a phase one study, and I mentioned like what does the other data show? Well, there were 16 subjects, age 13 to 34, in the phase one study. They got 12 weeks of drug, and the pharmacokinetic how the drug actually is metabolized and works in the body, and some of the clinical risk benefits seem to be favorable, which is why they proceeded on the bigger study. So it seems like there's some promise to the drug. Um, as I look at the studies prior, it's enough that I would say, yeah, that's reasonable for my patient interested to, to think about going in. Now, the protocols are not necessarily released outside of the PIs because that is confidential information for many of these pharmaceutical companies. Um, it's, it's a pharmaceutical trial, so you will have to reach out to the PI or to the company to figure out the exact details of, of that. That was the, the red question that I, was, that I was talking about. So I'm going to go off clinical trials.gov now as we get back to our sort of last 15 minutes of discussion because um, there's a lot more studies going on. Um, some started before the new year. There's some areas of microdistribution studies that are now starting to talk about recruitment. Um, and want to talk about some highlights of, of things that I'm seeing coming out as we go forward. Um, first off, I can't forget to mention natural history studies. Now, some of these are on clinicaltrials.gov, like the Pearson's um, natural history study, lung girdle, there's a lung girdle trial as well. But there are things that are not always listed on clinicaltrials.gov, especially if you look at the rare genetic diseases. Um, they may be local site studies, or especially, for example, I have a, a data bank I have that is for POM, GNT1, general muscular dystrophy, a very small group of patients. For some of these type of studies, you have to find the patient networks advocacy groups and they can direct you if you're interested in being involved. I can't say how valuable, I can't say enough how valuable these natural history studies are. We need the data and we need more data. A lot of the data that we have had you know, 20, 30 years ago was focused very much on um, survival, muscle strength, breathing, maybe cardiac. Then we sort of, but as we've gotten more treatments, now we have to also look at things like bone health, neurocognitive outcomes. And um, I was actually just at giving a, a, on a panel a few weeks ago, we were talking about how we have a lack of data in Duchenne's, for example, for long-term neurocognitive outcomes of our guys, because you know, the typical Duchenne boy before we had treatments was passing away early and as life expectancy is starting to become longer and longer, we have to start thinking about what is, how does this affect them getting jobs and having you know, normal social situations and things like that. There's um, some of these actually built by organizations. So MDA has the mover database. Um, so if you are going to the MDA center and have books of diseases, you may be asked to participate. That's really great because we can then pull data and look at longitudinal information. Uh, QSMA has a registry, PPMB has a Duchenne's registry. Now I understand that for some diseases, there are many registries and it's, it's hard to be in all these together. Um, this is where we're gonna talk with your, your site about which ones they're participating in. Um, and which ones they think, you know, based off the data are good for you, um, but more to know. There's also pharmaceutical databases. For example, the Novartis Avexis has an SMA registry where they're looking at patients longitudinally as well. Um, that has actually pulled out some interesting information on safety data, um, looking at Zolgensma things. Um, for example, there was a paper that came out in the last year looking at a little bit of um, some kidney problems that can occur with Zolgens, but that was not seen in the initial, st uh, initial, initial study to get it approved in the U.S. because the end number may not have been big enough. Um, as we get bigger and bigger amounts of patients, we can find that, you know, maybe side effects that are incredibly rare, we start to notice. Um, for rare diseases, you know, having 100 patients in a study is amazing, but if your side effect is one in a thousand, you may not capture that data. So this is why these longitudinal follow-up studies are really important and create families to participate. Um, now, microdystrophin, I have to mention, because obviously this is, this is a hot topic. And um, if you follow the public press, if you follow the media, the scientific reports, it's, I call it sort of an adventure movie because it's sort of, you get good and bad and you never quite know where we're going. Um, there's a couple of different companies that are doing these type of trials. But remember that the trials are ongoing and not all the data is public. So we're only, unless you're involved in the trial, you only get to see a certain percentage of what's coming out publicly released. Uh, for example, solid had some really safety questions. That seems to be better. We'll see what efficacy shows. Sarepta had that data release a little while ago that said, well, maybe it wasn't as enthusiastic, but if you took the smaller subgroup of younger kids that had, had better outcomes, we'll see how that looks going forward. Pfizer had some patients with cardiac complications. Oh, but you know, maybe that's a genetic subtype only. So if they change their protocol, we'll see if that can be avoided. Um, overall, my view is these type of therapies do have promise. 
um, the, out, the outcome data seems to be good. Um, and as we move forward with things and start to re redefine um, a little more some of the subtypes of, or subgroups that we're able to treat with different, different drugs, and um, it, I think that we're going we're gonna to get some good results is my, my guess. Um, now, the questions I sometimes see from families and some other you know, PCPs and uh, providers are, well, can we compare the data? Not yet. For one, one thing, we don't have all the, all the face data to compare, and there will be some variances between the trials that may well make that hard to have perfect comparison. The good news is, is we have multiple therapies. Now, these are gene replacement therapies. They don't fix someone's DNA, but they are putting a shorter version of dystrophin back in the, the nucleus with the idea of, you know, maybe the whole big dystrophin is ideal, but a shorter version may be better than, than what's being produced now. Um, the good news is we have multiple studies that are competing, right? We're in a, a time in an era where we have people who are studying how to treat a same genetic disease in multiple ways. Um, I know there are some frustration amongst families with the rare diseases or the rare mutations. Um, this is non-mutation non specific when it would get to clinical use. Obviously, the trials are avoiding some of the milder, milder variants in many of these trials so that they have better data. But for those who have rare diseases that are not Duchenne's, uh, I know there's some frustration about why can't we have those drugs? More to come on that. Um, and then of course, gene editing. Now this has been talked about for a long, long time, but uh, Vertex, Cure Rare Disease, Sarepta, they're all coming out with preclinical type data on for Duchenne's for gene editing. This is CRISPR-Cas9 that people have talked about where you can go and change the actual DNA um, and then sort of make it that it works better. Um, so in neuromuscular diseases, as far as I've been able to find, it's all preclinical, but there is some non-neuromuscular diseases that are doing clinical human trials and some of that data is encouraging. So we can't necessarily say that means neuromuscular data is gonna be encouraging as well, but it does say, hey, no one has turned purple, no one has exploded, you know, things look fairly good with those type of thing, that type of administration. Hopefully this means that for our kiddos as well, this is gonna be something that coming down the road is, is beneficial. Um, I bring this slide back up only because the idea of, as we look at CRISPR editing, this the idea is, is gene editing is actually changing it. So where we talk about exon skipping, where you would not have that 51 become part of your RNA, this is DNA, this is RNA, and you have a shortened functional protein. With the idea with CRISPR-Cas9 is, well, if you know 51 is there, we can actually just reframe it, right? So we take this back part out and cut it out, and we can have 49 then fit in there already. The ideal is that we're fixing the DNA here. So the question is, how often do we have to redose? Maybe not as much. Um, is this something that is maybe a one-time dosing? And, and again, more to come on that because there's some big questions of until we have the research on the longitudinal effectiveness, the 20, 30-year data, you can never be guaranteed. Now, I mentioned a little bit before about these ultra-rare diseases, right? So you have, an, you have a child who has the end of one or there's four kids in the world with that one gene change. Oh my gosh, then we're never gonna get to those kids. Not necessarily. Um, in Lorem, I use this example. This is a nonprofit. Um, they actually came out of Ionis, which helped um, develop mucinosin that then was worked with Biogen on it. Um, Biogen is now the, the manufacturer of, of, of mucinosin for SMA, but they're actually looking at rare diseases, ends of one to 10 patients, um, and using antisensible nucleotides. So that's a sort of skipping mechanism that we, I talked about in SMA. If, you're, if a child is amenable, they're considering for that case. They're a nonprofit, so what you'd have to do for these type of organizations is typically your physician would reach out to them, send in a proposal with the genetics. They would want to look at, you know, first off, is this something that they think is amenable? There might have to be some basic science studies that go on, um, and if it gets approved, then possibly can move forward. Um, for those people who are interested in this, there's also there was a medical paper that came out a year and a half ago about um, a patient with a non-neuromuscular disease, Batten's disease, where this was sort of the, the therapy coming out. But more and more people are looking at this as well. So a lot of hope there as we move forward. And as people understand the mechanisms and the delivery models and more common diseases, it's easier to pull out that, that theory into the rare diseases. Now, there's also some place that academic centers or certain organi other organizations that maybe aren't, aren't pu as big as publicized um, that do this as well. So again, for the rare diseases, this is where it's important for those families to get involved with the nonprofit group for their rare disease um, and, and work with those groups on finding, finding those options and opportunities or getting involved in the natural history data to get the data to start moving towards that treatment therapy. So I do talk a little fast and I apologize that for that, but I know we may have, may have some questions. So it's the overview of all this is in the last year, it's been fascinating where we're going. Um, a lot of stuff is coming out. A lot of trials are coming out, especially for the more common MDA cover diseases. But even for the other rare diseases, we're seeing a lot more therapies come out. Um, and it's an accelerating process, which is also a, a fascinating thing. Um, and 
I mean, I'm, as I said, assistant professor, and I've seen, when I started, there was nothing in the last seven years. We've had many drugs coming out, so much more to come. Um, but sort of, this is sometimes how we all feel, I think, is sort of this goofiness of, we don't know what's going to happen as we try to answer these questions. So bear with your, your physician providers as we work through this with you. Thank you so much for having me. Any questions? Thank you so much for that presentation, Dr. Herman Link. Um, I would now like to open this webinar to our attendees for any questions that you may have for Dr. Herman Link. Um, like I had previously mentioned in the beginning of the webinar, if you hover over the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q&A bubble. So you can click on that bubble and type in your questions. So I'm just gonna leave a minute or two for any questions to come in. All right, so I'm not seeing any questions right now, but I just wanted to give a reminder that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on MDA.org. So if you do watch it and you do have any questions, um, you can email mdaengage at mdausa.org. I would again like to thank our presenter for today, um, Dr. Harmelink. We sincerely appreciate your time and expertise and everything that you do for the neuromuscular community. So thank you so much. Thank you.